Well, the, the FinTech Lab, what is it? It is, we call it a graduate school of accelerators. It is for companies that are at really the product stage that want to understand how does their product actually fit within the market. And if you think of the FinTech Lab as a bridge that connects companies at that stage to their market, that's really what the FinTech Lab does. And the market that we're connecting you to are the major financial institutions in New York. A quick background on the Partnership Fund. We are a nonprofit impact fund. We're backed by major corporations in New York City. The $135 million in our fund was raised by Henry Kravis in the late 90s. But we are mission driven to create jobs in New York City and grow the economy. And so we're uh, the nonprofit pieces that we are evergreen. And if we make investments and we get returns from those investments, they come back to our fund. So we have uh, deep connections in the corporate sector. We're the investment arm of the partnership for New York City. And that is the industry sort of association or, or the organization that represents the CEOs of the 300 major employers. For those of you that track these things, uh, you've probably seen the surveys from the New York business community over the last two years about who's back in the office and who's not. Those are done by our organization. So the partnership side of the house has deep relationships with government, elected officials, and at the C-suite uh, with many of the, comp of the uh, financial institutions that are part of the FinTech Lab. And then the partnership fund makes the investments and is much more involved in the uh, innovation side of the house, uh, entrepreneurs, venture funds, et cetera. Um, Accenture, I think, needs no introduction. They have a much bigger marketing budget than we do, but one of the leading consulting firms um, and uh, does a lot of work with financial services firms. Uh, so we joined together in 2008 to put this program together, and we have run it for the last uh, 12 years as a civic program to help grow not just the financial, to help grow the fintech or technology side of financial services. Because longer term, we believe that New York's economy is stronger for having financial services as well as the innovation here. And that framing of being a civic program has allowed us to maintain and, and engage very senior representatives from, these, uh, from our partners because they're coming to the table to obviously look for the innovations that you all are developing, but also they're doing it to do something for New York City. And so I think you'll find that that messaging is used by our partners to make sure that you're getting meetings with the right people. Um, as I said, we think we, we that really has enhanced the uh, the quality of the program and the level of engagement. Um, so again, think of the kind of takeaway from the slide is think of us as a graduate school. So we're not just for companies that are still coding and that we're a bridge to connect you to your market. Uh, next page. We've, as I said, now run 12 cohorts. Um, we track a couple of key statistics. Um, we don't provide money as part of the program, but we focus on helping you get customers, which then can lead to some very interesting statistics, as you'll see on this page. So the alums, so this is post-program, the 99 companies have raised $2.4 billion. And again, that's not one company that's raised 2.3 and the rest raising 100 million. That's been pretty evenly spread across most of the graduates. We've got 40 partners, uh, 20 of the companies have uh, been acquired. Of the remaining, over 85% of them are still in business. And we think given that you're working in the, um, uh, in the startup ecosystem, we think that's a very good statistic that shows the power of understanding what your customer wants and, and having access to them. And then the other thing we, we, that we track are uh, the POCs or proof of concepts or pilots that are in discussion, serious discussion, or in place at the end of the program. Almost nobody sells anything to a bank in three months, but the, that POC or the pilot is the first uh, kind of marker. And, and, and I think if you do the math, that statistic shows you that every company that's gone through the lab has exited the three months with between kind of two, three, four um, pilots underway. Uh, we've got a couple, a couple of the alumni uh, listed below who are all and continue to do well. Um, next slide. And then these are our partners. Um, we have over 40 major financial institutions. Uh, we do not charge them to participate. What we ask of them is something that we think is far more valuable. Their expertise, 
and their time and access to them. And that's really what they come to the table. They come to the table and they're deeply involved in the selection process. So we're not going off in a vacuum and picking 10 companies that we think are the most interesting. We serve up the application pool and we get about 200, 220 applications for each, uh, each year. And then those financial institutions are the ones that drive the selection of the cohort. So the companies that get into the lab and get an offer to come are those where a critical mass of those 40 institutions have put their hand up and said, we think XYZ company is doing something very interesting and very relevant to us. And then during the course of the program, most of the time that the entrepreneurs and companies spend in the program is engaging with a subset of uh, the companies that have ranked them of high interest. We also have, and I'll get into that, uh, what that actually means in a second, um, but just to finish up on this slide, we've got a great group of venture capital firms that are around the table. Um, we recognize they are a, a, a range of um, uh, kind of stages at which they develop. So in some cases, they're early stage investors, some are later stage, um, but they provide coaching around your pitch. And as we, as you know, the best time to get to know somebody that has money is not to ask them for money, but to ask them for feedback. And so they are around the table to provide that um, as you would like. Next slide, please. So, as I said, the financial institutions select the cohort. Then each of them puts up their hand and they say, we are most interested in this, these one or two companies. So that each financial institution is working with one or two companies. And that means given the math again, that each company uh, that's selected for the cohort has four to six uh, of those financial institutions and insurance companies who are explicitly assigned to them. We provide opportunities for you to meet the balance of them. But what we've seen over the years is having four to six gives you a range of opinions um, and feedback around your product. And it also, uh, so you get a sense of what the industry might be interested in without locking you into one particular um, uh, organization specific needs. And then you have a chance to really hone what the right use case is before you go back then to the broader uh, group of the 40. We have a number of touch points where we bring those uh, the representatives from those financial institutions back together. So they are sharing with each other how things go. And so what we've seen happen a number of times is you work with this four to six, and then at the end of the program, a number of the other firms, based on how things have gone with your officially assigned mentors, will put their hand up and say, you know, we'd like to learn more. We want to spend time with that company. The other thing, the other key thing to, um, to understand about this program is that we create a little bit of a construct. We do not, um, this is not a program for you to come in and do a hard sales pitch, to come in and sell, 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 sell. The financial institutions, again, because this is a civic program, really take that mentorship approach very seriously. And they are there, think of them as sort of adopting you for three months. They are there to really help you become as good and an interesting a company as you can. You're obviously doing something that they think is interesting, but it's the difference between a informational interview for a job and a job interview. This is a really unique opportunity for you to put your product in front of a potential customer and have them give you honest feedback, because that's really the ask of these institutions, is for them to tell you what they like about your product and what they don't like about your product and what might be missing, or to help you hone in on the use cases. Many data companies could be used in five different places within a large organization. And the conversation you can have when you're being mentored is, who has budget, who, has, who needs my product today, and who might I think about needing the product in three years so I don't waste my time today and focus on the people that need that. So the quality, and, and Patrick and I will get into that, but the quality of those conversations if it's a mentoring relationship as opposed to a sales relationship is really the thing that makes this program unique and also extremely powerful and sets you up then for, as you can see based on the numbers, success in years to come. There are some other pieces to this. As I said, two thirds of your time is gonna be spent in this mentorship with the financial institutions. We do have a, uh, a leadership program and a group of mentors. Um, 
That is a little bit more light touch. Uh, we have a couple of panel discussions with uh, luminaries in New York and other bank uh, and financial services executives, so you can get in front of those that you're not officially assigned. And then we have a wonderful uh, uh, mentor network um, of people who have all been entrepreneurs themselves for the most part and can help you with those set of questions that you may not want to take to a customer, but are really about helping you build the business. Uh, I covered the last, the next point um, about uh, most people leaving with uh, a number of POCs underway, and then there's there's no fee or warrants taken um, for this for the program for you to apply. Next slide. Uh, the leadership program. Um, these are just some examples of. Um, we have a couple of panel discussions. We try to make them very practical and actionable. So, what does it mean to do a POC? Should you charge? What should you charge? How do you navigate bank procurement with executives from from the procurement departments? And they give you very specific advice about what works with them. And then we spend some time on the regulatory and compliance environments because all those institutions are regulated and have to deal with compliance. So we have uh, compliance officers um, a panel for them to talk about what do they what do they care about? And then we also spend a day in Washington. And we meet with the uh, a number of you'll see the the letters there, the agencies, so that you can understand the environment in into which you're selling. And every once in a while, I would say every year, a couple of the companies go to those meetings and they come back with use cases about how their technology can help solve an issue that a regulator has. Um, and then we help you with uh, media messaging and uh, PR. Uh, next slide. Um, these are some of our execs and residents. Um, next slide, Morteza. So these are some of our uh, um, executives and residents. Uh, if you can go back, um, they we have a CEO, a CISO in residence, CTO in residence. Uh, we have two ex former regulators in residence. Those are very interesting conversations, and then a scientist in residence. And you're able to book time as you like to uh, to have one on one conversations with them. And then, so who should apply, and what stage should you be at? Um, sweet spot is post seed pre Series A for those of you that have raised money. But basically, you need a robust beta of your product. You shouldn't still be coding it. It needs to be at the point where in late March and uh, April, somebody could look at your product and do a POC to see what it's to see how it, how it starts to work. Um, and obviously you come to this program because that group of financial institutions is your target market. So you're a B2B, you're a B2B to C or a white label solution for that market. Um, and you can be a fintech and sure tech or an enterprise tech company. But again, it's our, is that group your target customer base? And then uh, we since we're now hopefully post COVID or some version of post COVID, uh, we do ask that you will uh, you be in New York from late March through the end of June. Uh, Zoom has been a very powerful tool as is teams, but nothing beats in person uh, engagement. And so we we will have uh, some of those. It ends up being a hybrid program, but but the in person piece is uh, is important. Um, and then lastly, before I ask Patrick to come on, um, we survey next slide, Morteza, then we survey um, our 40, those 40 institutions and ask what their priorities are. This is what they've asked for. It's on the website, so I won't uh, go through it. And then last page is the dates. So um, the uh, Application deadline is this week on December 1st. Um, we will let you know uh, end of January if you are accepted, because again, your application is going to be reviewed by financial institutions. Um, the program will start late March. You will know, you know, sort of, um, if you make the, at the end of January, we do a first cut. We bring back 30 companies to make oral pitches to, again, rooms full of financial executives. Um, that's in early February, um, and then the program starts in late March, and you'll know at the kind of end of February, beginning of March, if you're accepted to the program. Okay, so with that, um, let me invite Patrick to come on screen. Hello, Patrick. So Hi, Maria. Let's do a quick introduction. So a quick introduction of yourself and your company, and uh, they were, uh, UTIL was in the class of 2021, so it was 
you were 100 percent virtual, as I recall. We were 100 percent <laughs> virtual, so we were we were in the in the real like the the, the depths of COVID. Things, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so I'm the CEO at Util. Um, and what Util does is we um, use machine learning and AI to measure the uh, sustainability of companies against the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Our target market, um, as is appropriate for this particular group, is uh, large asset managers and global banks. And so we were part of the cohort in 2021. And we had an opportunity to work with seven institutions over that three month period. Great. Um, all right, so let's switch to the lab. So why did you apply and how did you hear about us? So I, I heard about the lab from actually my former boss, funnily enough, who sent me an email and said, you you might want to consider this. And so I, I looked at it, so I, I thought it was interesting. To your point earlier about this being a, a graduate lab, I think that's that's sort of an understatement for the the way I differentiate, differentiate you guys from other labs. Um, I've done accelerators before, as um, many of you since you're all entrepreneurs, you, you'll know that it is uh, something of an inescapable condition. And if you, you're an entrepreneur now, you've probably been one before as well. But I've, I've done other labs that were just very, very, very different, um, just in terms of the, the way in which they're organized, the level of engagement, the, the framing and structure of that engagement, all of that was different. So it looked different. But the thing that actually compelled me to join was that I looked through the list of alumni um, and I found that there was someone in my network who uh, had been an alum a few years ago. And this was the it was the funniest thing. So I was thinking, you know, oh, I've done a ton of these accelerators. Do I really want to do another one? Like I've, I've got a company to run. What you know, do I really do this? And I, I was sitting commenting um, and thinking to myself, you know, unless I hear back that this is like the single best thing that has ever happened to this company, I think I'm going to skip it. And literally, as I thought that to myself, an email arrived from this uh, alumni. And the first line of the email was, the FinTech Lab was literally the single best thing my company has ever done. And so that's why I applied. OK, excellent. Um, and just so you all know, Patrick and I just, we haven't talked about this. So this is, uh, he's not pre This is a totally new story to you. <laughs> so, um, so all right, so you had you came in great expectations. A very high bar was set by your friends. So, um, so but so what were your expectations going in? And then I mean, you you had obviously, but but a little bit more specific than that in terms of how it was going to work. And then and what was, what was met and and what was not met. Well, so it, it is true the expectations were really set very high. Um, so that was one component. I will say that. Um, the the way in which um, so the, I'll, I'll be a little bit more specific about those expectations too because I think the key thing about them was to really make sure um, going into this that the expectation was really about the level of engagement and what I was likely to get out of the lab for my company um, in terms of constructive feedback in terms of the way in which we might want to develop our product in terms of additional knowledge that you can only get by talking directly to senior executives in these firms um, so not just like you know do you like the color of the you know the ui or something but actually you know is this genuinely useful does it move the needle for the institution that level of information was what we were really looking for um, and that expectation i would say we engage with seven firms um, some of them moved faster than others, and the the ones that moved fastest were like deeply informative. I think you know we got m much much more out of it, um, and we may end up coming to this later on. But I think the key thing for my company, at least, was to make sure that we put enough into it as well. I think um, approaching this casually would be a mistake um, because then you actually don't get all of the all of the kind of benefits on the other side. Um, so let's let's stick with that concept of feedback um, and the level of engagement. So t just say a little bit a little bit more about that kind of the level of people you you met with, how how they how they engaged were how engaged were they, what resources did you have to put against them? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we engaged a, across a number of different use cases. I think that that's part of it. Actually, was that we were able to engage across those use cases. I will say that we engaged generally at a, 
a senior enough level that we were talking about the strategic value of the, those use cases rather than the kind of minutiae of, the, of those of those use cases. So again, this is the kind of thing where outside of the fintech lab, it can take you a really long time to network your way gradually up to the point where someone's talking about those kind of organizational objectives. And so that was really key, was to sort of cut to the chase and be connected immediately with someone. Um, it, in our case, it, it might have been about how ready we were for funding. Uh, that was one of the one of the questions that came up was like, are you are you in good enough shape um, in terms of how you're structured? Um, other things might be, for instance, um, do you have a, a version of your product that is easily testable? Um, is it too difficult to get it across to the people who need, you know, in whose hands it needs to be before you even know anything? So those sorts of things are really, really critical just from a practical standpoint. Um, and then, of course, hearing directly from people at that senior level of how important is it to, to do the thing that your product is doing for the firm is, is really key as well. So I, I think those were the um, in terms of the level of engagement and the kind of feedback that we received, it was it was all incredibly strategic and incredibly helpful. OK, uh, we I talked about the fact that we uh, create a little bit of a construct that it's not uh, a place for you to go sell. That must have been a little surprising because no entrepreneur <laughs> likes to be told you can't sell. But uh, can I guess can you in your own words explain why that works? Oh, it was, I'll have to say it was totally liberating um, because if you take that off the table, then um, in some ways, I, I'll, I'll sort of frame it slightly differently, but but um, once that's off the table, you're really, you're suddenly not negotiating anything. And it means that the dynamic of that conversation is is completely changed so that you can actually talk about, well, what is the value? And and as long as you you both clear at the outset, we're not going to talk about this as a sale. Then they can really honestly tell you what the value is without having to. You know, if you picture that as a sales conversation, that's going to be all second guessing about. Let me show enough <laughs> value, but second guess whether that I'm kind of giving too much away, et cetera. And so, if you remove the sales from there, you just get immediately into the into the question of how useful is it. What are the strategic objectives of the firm? How do you meet those? How do you help? How do you not help? Um, and it just it suddenly um, opens up a whole wealth of feedback that that is normally it's just much, much harder to get if you've got sales kind of still on the table. And did that prohibit you from then selling after the program? No, it actually put us in better shape to sell. So that's one of the things that has been really interesting is that actually it sets up the relationship um, well, first of all, it sets up a, a relationship that is actually easier to sell into once the lab is over. So that's the first thing is that you you have a relationship that then um, it a lot of that is now facilitated because you you're kind of familiar to the organization anyway. Um, but also, I think a lot of what goes into a sale is about the way in which you deliver on your promises as a company and the way in which you interact with your uh, potential clients. Um, a lot of that, uh, interestingly enough, is about the sort of trust and all of those other things that are not really, um, that they're actually somewhat indirect in a sales conversation. You sort of don't feel like they're front and center. If you take the sales off the table, then really all you have is like a human relationship of of kind of, honesty and trust, and then that's just much easier to build from in the, in the first place. I, I like to say, you know, an enterprise sale is a relationship sale. It's different mm -hmm. than direct to consumer. You know, you've got to have the, the there's a there's a level of trust that has to happen. Um, so talk, uh, post post lab, tell us what mm -hmm. happened, what's happened with your company. Well, so a, a few things. We've raised money twice. Um, so that's happened post lab. Uh, it's been great. Um, actually, uh, uh, a couple of uh, I'm, several of those relationships with the lab are, are, are still ongoing. Um, we've had pilots that have uh, come to fruition. Those have turned into clients, which is wonderful. So we've got enterprise clients as a result um, of the relationships that we built in the lab. Um, 
funnily enough, um, we've also uh, grown the team with people from institutions that were in the lab, which is great too. So that that's also people in those institutions became familiar with us that way and, and then came to find us afterwards. So that's wonderful. Um, so those are the, the sort of major things. I will say um, in terms of the more direct uh, feedback and how that's fed into the, the company in general, um, the, the impact on the product was really huge. I think getting such concentrated feedback over the course of the three months allowed us to develop something that we can put in front of clients not only with a degree of confidence, but also based on real, you know, real interactions. We're not just sort of guessing and then having to rework it once we find out it's not working. We've we've sort of gone through that process. So it put us a lot further along um, than any other sort of three month period, I would say, because of that that direct feedback. Um, we launched uh, we launched an, a, a web portal direct, you know, actually we launched a beta version during the lab, and that was one of the things that was fed into by the lab because they said you need one. <laughs> and so we did that, but that's that's completely um, sped up our sales process too. So we have things to put in front of clients that are much easier. Uh, so a lot of the kind of post lab has been in, in sort of, I would say continuation of the momentum that the lab set up. Okay. Um Let's just, uh, just if you could say a few words about the other pieces, that the leadership program, which is the set of panel discussions and the mentor. Mm -hmm. how, did you, uh, how did you utilize those and kind of your thoughts on, on those? Oh, well, so, so I'll, I'll tell a, a brief story, but this will be a really good illustration of just what the lab is like, because I, I don't think this would have happened in another place. But um, there are obviously sessions with luminaries, uh, the ones that I, I think of, it. they were all incredibly helpful. I think as CEOs slash founders, it it is a very um, and people say that it's a lonely job. It's it's a very peculiar combination of of responsibilities. Um, I I don't find that I'm lonely exactly, but I I am the only person who thinks about all the things that I think about at the same time. So, um, but it's amazing to have the ability to hear about these things from people who've done it for their entire careers. So Chris Conde is a really good example. His company was three people when it started, and when he retired, it was a Fortune 500 bank. <laughs> so, like that's a, you know, if anybody's done it, um, done it well, it's it's Chris Conde. And um, and actually, Chris, after the lab, became an investor, and he's one of our advisors. Um, and so that relationship is one that I I absolutely treasure, um, and I consult him all the time. The other um, that is is slightly less. Um, one, one that is, is, I think, another perfect illustration is, is someone who's not an investor um, is Henry Kravis, who gave a, a presentation. And at the end of the presentation, he said, if there's someone that you're thinking about reaching out to, um, just go ahead and do it. The worst they can do is say no or not respond to you. So if, you, if you're going to send an email to Jamie Dimon, just go ahead and do it. Someone else will if you don't. And so like a week or two passed, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to email Henry Kravis, which I did. And so I, I'm going to, and I, in the email, I said, I'm taking your exact advice and I'm emailing you because I'd like to talk to you. Um, and funnily enough, he responded. And so we had a chat, which was a, like, it was immensely helpful. I talked to him about the company, about what to do next, about how to think about the market, about, you know, um, but we had a, a good hour long chat directly as a result of this. And, you know, again, it's it's Henry Kravis. It's not like it's just some random person. It's it's yeah. a really significant piece of advice. But I don't think any other um, accelerator would have given me that that opportunity. That's great. I didn't I didn't know that. So that's a, that's that's good to know. Um, so let's switch now to the application. Um, how hard was it to do? So. I think it, it was a combination of things. So there are, there are two levels. And I think, again, a, a lot of it, um, it's not the difficulty. I think it's actually the process itself is seamless. I think the challenge is one of responsibility for communicating clearly. Um, that can be challenging. And I think that's the place where the effort needs to put it, be put in. Uploading the video, actually doing the application is easy. It's making sure that you can clearly communicate what you're doing and why it's worthwhile that is challenging. And I think that's, but that's a, when when I did it, 
again, you will appreciate this because it was like the day before that I got the email that said this is the best thing that we've ever done. <laughs> um, so I did do it quickly and that was the challenge. But I also thought to myself, if I can't clearly explain what my company is about um, overnight, then I, I'm clearly this is, you know, not the not the biggest of my problems. So I, I think the most important thing is to be able to to communicate concisely. And that's the challenge. But aside from that, the, the actual process itself was seamless. Um, and then the the finalists in January, that was awesome. I absolutely loved it. It was intense, but that was wonderful, too. Yeah, and what what he's talking about is that we, as I, as I mentioned, we down select to 30 companies and then each company that's selected comes in and does a 10 minute pitch um, and then there's 15 minutes of Q&A, but the Q&A is coming from financial institution executives. And I don't know if, if, I, if you remember, but we always recommend that the entrepreneur come with somebody to take notes because just the kind of questions that are being asked are very illustrative of what their issues are and concerns are with your product. Um, and then, and then that's then we down select from them uh, thereafter. Uh, you know what you because it was virtual. What you did not get, which we're going to um, assuming COVID stays stable, um, we as a, as kind of the last piece of the selection process. We did it by Zoom, but it's much more powerful in person. We have a the equivalent of a tech fair. So those thirty companies are then down selected to twenty, and then everybody has the effective of a table or a booth, and then we invite representatives from all the 40 companies or FIs to come, and then they can go around and visit each of the companies over the course of a morning. And so the the energy and the quality of engagement uh, of that day is something that we've definitely missed during COVID, but we're looking forward to bringing that back this year because you really get a chance to meet them face to face and, and engage with that, uh, that group. Um, so you gave a good piece of advice about um, this is for the application about being clear. Any other um, advice for applicants as they think about both the written application and then that oral presentation? Um, I'm trying to. Th I mean, I think the the as I think back, that was the most challenging thing. I think the other aspect is to be very. Um, non-salesy, I think is probably the best way to describe it. I think uh, the the real power of the program is it lies in in thinking about uh, value creation separate from sales. Um, and I, I think that that's really, really key. So I think in the application, that's also really important to get across. And I think actually it's beneficial for, and in in my case, for my company, it was beneficial to think in those terms as well because it sort of lifts you out of that um of of the kind of call it sort of sales marketing kind of language even uh and puts you into space where you're thinking just thinking a little bit more broadly and with a slightly kind of wider aperture in general okay um and if you had to sort of describe the biggest shift that you as a as a leader and also as your company from a product perspective made from when you sort of were applying to the lab to when you exited the lab in terms of kind of the, the key your key takeaway benefit lessons learned over that that the process and I'm going to put the application process plus mm -hmm. the three months. What would, the, what, would, what would you say those were? I would say there were there were two levels to it. Um, I would say at the company level um, the clearest takeaway that we found was uh, was about focus. Um, I think dealing with these institutions, it was really, really clear that you can't just, you can't have a blurry view of what you're offering. Uh, again, it sort of comes back to what the communication aspect, but it, these are all sort of symptoms of the same underlying, <laughs> underlying condition where, um, yeah, if you have a fuzzy view, and I'll say this out of experience because I think we did go into the lab at the beginning I think we communicated very clearly, obviously at a at a general level, but when it came to use cases, we were still discovering, um, and we had some you know fuzzy ideas, um, and those are the ones that that were least successful um, in terms of exploration, 
And I think that was one of the things that was really key. So focus was a really was a really big component. And then I think clearly related to focus um, is time management. Um, and not just one's own time, but other people's time. I think that's really key. I think the idea of making sure that no one's time is wasted is really, really key. Um, and that that happens on both sides. Um, and one thing that I will share that that um, I think is sort of, a, it's not immediately obvious, but I think it did really, really help us was that when we were going into conversations, we made sure uh, there were several of us from the company who were involved, all of us made sure that any questions that we asked were directed specifically at the person and their domain and their expertise. So don't ask a question that you want to know the answer to, to the wrong person. Um, and don't ask general questions when you yeah. can ask specific ones, I think is really, because again, it comes back to how, how people's time is managed. Okay. I would say one of the biggest shifts that um, I see entrepreneurs make is they come in talking about their product and all the wonderful things that it can do as a, you know, all the bells and whistles. And those that pay attention and really, so I think get into the spirit of taking feedback and et cetera, uh, and they leave by first talking about the product they're solving for the customer. Mm -hmm. And then here's how we solve it. Because if the customer hasn't figured out that they have this problem or that it's not relevant to them, they're actually not going to pay attention to all the details that you worked for seven on as an entrepreneur. So I would say that's the biggest shift that we help entrepreneurs make. And that just makes them those future conversations with people. You know, you can get their attention faster in a, in a, in a meaningful way as opposed to a polite conversation about what you're doing. Um, so any, uh, and we're going to be turning to questions very shortly. Uh, so any final suggestions, notes to share? Because we've got all hope, presumably future applicants uh, who are joining the call today. Any uh, any advice for them as they think about both applying and then if they get in, you know, making the most of the lab? Um, well, the the only thing that I can think of that I haven't shared already um, may be obvious to many of you already, but practice your pitch. <laughs> Is the biggest thing. <laughs> it sounds really dumb, but but you have no idea how valuable it is just to record yourself on camera saying what you plan to say. Um, it makes makes all the difference. If you haven't done it already, I highly recommend it. It's if you haven't done it already, it's painful to watch the first time, but you learn a lot. Okay, uh, I'm gonna add to that as well, and practice your pitch as if you're talking to a ten year old. It's or a board of directors, because it's the same thing, you know, uh, particularly like a board of directors. They're full of very smart people that may not have your particular domain expertise. So you need to explain it in plain English what you do, and then they can figure out, oh, I, great, that is a problem we have. Let me go get the right domain expert. So I'm a big fan, as you know, Patrick, of plain English. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. So we uh, we're gonna now turn it over to questions. Um, and I don't know if there's any in the chat, Morteza, or if uh, people want to put their hands up. Um, we don't have any questions yet. No questions. Okay. Um, so everybody, this is your this is your chance to ask questions. Um, I see one hand up from MP. Okay. okay Hi, um, and my apologies, I joined late. Will this recording be made available? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay, because I did miss part of the beginning. Thank you. Okay. And? I actually oh, think also that Anne actually just asked the same question that I had which was, was it going to be available? The other question I have is um, for um, for the video part, um, it has to be two minutes. Is that it? It can't be longer. It can't be a demonstration. It has to be you on the on on it. Is that it? Your your application is going to be sent as a batch of 20 to a uh, executive at a number of financial, each application is reviewed by two or three executives from financial services firms. They're looking at a batch of 25. 
So the reason why we recommend two minutes, you can make it longer, but that's about the attention span if you're going through a whole slew of applications. Got it, that makes sense, okay. My, my, another one of my favorite expressions is, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to make it shorter. Yes, no, I understand. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Sure. There, there is a question in the chat and let me read that out. What members of the team would be typically ex be expected to participate in the program aside from the CEO? Um, you probably, I mean, we leave it to you, but I think two things to, to consider. There are some meetings that are just for the CEO, you know, the, those very high level meetings with somebody like a, a Kravis or David Solomon. Um, but uh, when you are going in and having a set of the, the set of meetings with the that subset of companies that are mentoring you, you may want to be bringing in different team members. But I think certainly anybody on your team that's thinking about, you know, the product and the feature set and the use cases and the value proposition, because that's where you're going to spend a lot of your time. Um, but we, you know, at the beginning of the program, you sit down with the, the mentors from each of your assigned institutions and somebody from the Partnership Fund and Accenture at those meetings. And at that meeting, you work out the custom plan for you and your team. And so there may be, as part of that sort of set of, of, of meetings that you're going to have, there may be, you know, a need for you to sit down and meet with some of their regulatory uh, executives. And so you, that may be a different person from your team to bring into that. Um, you may, um, you know, you want if there's a, a set of conversations or feedback you're interested in about how do you integrate within their systems, you may want to bring more technical, more technical colleagues to that. So um, we really leave it to you to bring the appropriate people. Um, it's good to have a couple of your team members there from the beginning. Because again, remember, the financial institutions are, are, you know, they think you're doing something interesting. And inevitably, one of the questions that they have is, you know, can you deliver the goods? And if it's just a one person band that keeps showing up, they start to wonder about the depth of the team. So part of the reason to bring additional colleagues is to show the depth of your team as well. There is a question around um, the themes um, and, mm -hmm. and thesis areas and if people fit into that area or not, how should they kind of go about thinking of that? And I, I did send everybody a link of the press release where they can actually go read it, but uh, if you can share your thoughts around that. Yeah, uh, so that is uh, the list of where, of what they believe they want, but Inevitably, there is somebody every year that shows up with something that they had thought of and they like that too. So you should, if you don't fall within these categories, uh, you should not, you know, that doesn't mean you, you it, that does not mean you should not apply. So if you have, particularly if you have something different and unique that hasn't been done before, hasn't been thought of before, those actually they really, you know, that they love. We always think about putting another bullet on there as, you know, things we haven't thought of. <laughs> as well. Daniel, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. If you're talking, you're muted. We can't hear you. I am unmuted. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a baby in the background. Hopefully it's not disturbing everyone. Um, I had a couple of questions. One was, um, have you got a schedule for the program? about what activities and milestones are there, you know, in a week by week basis. And uh, just while I'm speaking, the other question was, do you have any target allocation for US versus international companies? Just because we're applying from the UK. Thanks. So the, uh, I'll do reverse order. So um, the, uh, the answer is no, we don't have an allocation. We're looking to select the best companies. Um, and sorry, the, the financial institutions select who they think are the most interesting and relevant to them. And it's, it's, it is regardless of, um, you know, location, et cetera. Um, we, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a big New York City focus about the program. Um, and we are willing to live with that openness because what we've seen is 
if you're not in New York and you get into the program, inevitably you realize we need to put people in New York because this is where our customers are. So we've had good sort of, uh, uh, the program's been a good way to attract companies and also for companies that are overseas to use it as a good sort of gateway to enter the US market. And then with respect to the specific dates, um, uh, we with that we don't we that we don't have until uh, you know kind of Mar a March time frame and we share it with the people that are in the program. Um, we try to cluster those um, panel discussions midweek, um, but you should assume that the first couple of weeks of last week of March and the first couple weeks of April um, is when it's going to be pretty heavy uh, in person. Um, and then usually, but and, and then you'll get the rest of the schedule um, of the events. So as I said, we try to do them midweek um, for people. But I think, you know, most of the time, as I said, you're actually meeting with executives from those financial institutions. So that all gets set up um, in early April. Then you work out the balance of when those meetings is going to happen um, at that point. It's very customized. This is not a, you know, you, you learn about the regulatory environment on week one. This is not school. This is graduate school where it's very custom to you and what your needs are and interests are. Um, an easy question. Is there any equity stake in, in terms? Uh, no, we, we there, there has been in past years, but not this year. Um, there's a question about time commitment over the three months. Uh -huh. Um, I don't know if Patrick is still on. If Patrick, if he is, if you want to, if Patrick, if you want to address kind of how much how much of your time the the program took, that might probably be better coming from you. Not I can. Have yeah, I, I mean it was. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. Um, I would say it took more of my time than it than it took of other team members time. But to Maria's point earlier, it was important to have other people on the team present a lot of the time. Um, and I think that was actually something that was quite compelling for the partners that we did work with, was that they saw that, you know, it wasn't just me that talked a big game <laughs> about the company, but they could talk to anybody else at the company and get similar views and similar, you know, kind of um, uh, basically a kind of similar, similar perspective on the company and what we're doing. But I would say um, it was pretty consuming, at least at the, for the first six weeks, I would say. Um, it probably took up, I'm going to say, like a third of my schedule. Um, and then the rest was obviously, you know, traditional running of the company. Um, there were certain weeks when it probably took up half my schedule, um, but it's worth prioritizing. I think that's the other key thing is that, you know, a, a crash course in prioritizing is probably what it, it ends up being for a lot of people. Um, but you should plan, and again, it's, it, it sort of does come back to you'll get out of it what you put into it. Um, so I think, you know, probably don't drop everything. You do still, you're, you are still going to have a company to run. Um, but I think, you know, it, it is very, very much worth prioritizing. So Patrick, for those weeks, that was a third of your time to a half of your time. What were you actually doing? Were you meeting with financial services executives? Overwhelmingly, yeah, it would be, um, and they would they would be senior, um, you know, senior executives. A lot of the time, we'd also be checking in on the progress with the various different use cases that we're exploring. Um, as we got further into the program, the more of that could be delegated to my colleagues, so I wouldn't need to be present in every meeting. But I, a lot of the time, I I really wished I could be because that gives me a much clearer sense of what kind of questions. Um, the institutions are asking how we're meeting those needs. Again, to your point earlier, Marie, about sort of the, the transition from thinking about your product to thinking about the problems that you're solving. You know, the, the more you can listen in those conversations, the more valuable it is. So, um, but yeah, a, a combination of those two things, the executives, um, those conversations where literally I, I would be asking what the problems look like, and then on the flip side, those other kind of ongoing meetings about you know how we're doing, and uh, the exploration of use cases would be the uh, the rest of the time. So then, just to elaborate a little bit on that, I think where Pat just to point out what what where Patrick was spending his time 
was meeting with executives from financial services firms. And I would say that if you're selling to financial services firms, that's where you should be spending your time. Right. And so if you think about like, is it a FinTech lab program? I mean, technically, yes, we're just making it easier for you to get to the right people that you should be talking to anyway. Okay, Evgeny. Thanks, Pat. Hi there, my name is Evgeny Alexandrov. And Maria, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Um, I lead Pilotbird. At Pilotbird, we use lifestyle analytics to reduce insurance fraud by catching bad actors. So my question to you, and I have another one, Patrick. Question to you, Maria, is how do you balance interest of various uh, sponsors into the program? You have limited number of spots in the program, uh, but you have many, uh, many sponsors. How do you balance uh, between filling in those spots and what's your take on managing balance between insure tech and fintech and various uh, verticals within uh, fintech industry? So uh, where where we have ended up, and and it's just it's worked out this way, so we haven't to do a lot of management of it. Is we've had a third fintechs, a third insure tech, and a third enterprise, and where the enterprise could be selling either into financial services or um, to insurance, and. You, companies get accepted into the program because a minimum number, so minimum three to four of those financial institutions have put their hand up and ranked you as of high interest. If you only get one of them that ranks you high and the rest are medium, you don't get the program. Because this is not about having a set of you know random conversations where we ask, will you please spend some time with this entrepreneur? It is they're doing something that the, the insurance or the bank thinks, wow, this is really interesting. We're prepared to spend our time out of our day job with this company. So it has actually worked out without us having to do a lot of, you know, uh, fine, uh, you know, strict lines around the numbers. Great. Thank you for clarifying for, that. You a question for Patrick. Yes, Patrick. And question for you is, um, you know, you mentioned about refining various use cases when speaking with executives. Uh, what have you seen successful for the founders who went through the program? Uh, is it having one specific use case or having a set of use cases and then narrowing down on certain ones, depending on interest from various sponsors into the program? What has worked well for you and for other founders in the program? So that's a really good question. I, I think actually um, the the most successful I would say the most successful outcome is is actually it's sort of the journey, and I'll like, explain what I mean by that. Which is that when I went into the program, or rather when the company went into the program, um, we do have a variety of use cases that that our product is useful for. So we, it's it's a data set; it can be used in in building financial products, reporting on financial products, in in um, research there's a there's a range of different things that it can be used for so we wanted to keep it fairly open at the beginning so if i would say that the most successful view is actually probably starting with a number of use cases to explore but then being pretty ruthless about narrowing them down uh, because you can't explore everything in such a limited you know amount of time and make progress so if you're if you're exploring seven different use cases over <laughs> over 12 weeks it's it's fairly diluted and you're not going to make much progress, but you also don't want to leave something out in case there's a use case that that you know you don't want to just assume a use case and then go with that one at the beginning. So I would say start with something fairly broad or some some hypotheticals that you can explore and then and then be be pretty vigorous about narrowing it down quickly. We have uh, we have two additional hands, so we'll try to get them through quickly. Christine, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Maria and Patrick. Uh, extremely insightful. So thank you so much for for making the time today. I did have a question in reference to vendor due diligence. So, um, being that sales is not the priority, it's understanding the use cases, understanding the value proposition, and and sort of co-defining that with these financial institutions that are interested. What was the process, though, post lab or during the lab um, around understanding vendor due diligence requirements like your SOC and your ISOs? And 
is that part of this lab and is there room not um, not no not explicitly so okay we uh we recommend that you sign an nda with the four to six that are officially assigned to you and then um so that that's in place and then if they decide to move forward um you know then you can start to get into that you know we do have that session around procurement and and there they talk about what their requirements generally are and what shape you should be in when you actually make it to the procurement desk that can be a set of questions, you know, remember with that first yeah. meeting you work out and you can say, hey, we'd really like to understand what your procurement requirements are, and they'll set up a session with their procurement people to do that. Excellent. Thank you, Maria. Sure. And then we got one last person. Uh, Giadrius. Hi, hi, Maria and Patrick. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, really insightful info session. Um, at Flow, we aim to serve the private markets, which includes financial institutions, but also venture capital and private equity firms. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to refer to one of your slides you showed about some of the lab partners, including venture capital firms. And I just wanted to get understanding if those venture capital firms get also involved as potential mentors to be assigned to companies, or is it just financial institutions and insurance companies? It's really the financial institutions um, who are officially assigned to you, but the VCs are around the table during the selection process. Um, and so, you know, if you're selected to come back in uh, February for the oral pitch, you know, I think, you know, some of them will be in the room and I think you, you would put out there, um, uh, and oh, by the way, our product can be used by XYZ. And remember, a lot of the big FIs also have their own venture groups and their own PE groups. But I think you should target it to that group because they their 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 interests are what drive who gets in the program, not the VCs. Thank you so much. OK, so we are at two o'clock. Um, so uh, again, application is not that long, although it's to take Patrick's advice and make sure you're very clear uh, so you can stand out. Uh, but I really want to thank you all uh, for showing up today, spending the hour with us and um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us, um, but appreciate the interest and really look forward to hopefully getting applications from you all. Thanks so much.